Every year or so I get to ride the latest version of the Honda CB500X, or NX500 as it's now known, and each time I come away with the same nagging question. Why would anyone, including me, want any more than this from a bike? It's comfortable, versatile, affordable to buy, cheap to run, easy to ride, decent braking and handling, powerful enough, just, you can venture off-road a bit, it's A2 license compliant, it's got a good warranty, there's a dealer in just about every town on the planet, and the fact that it's sold in just about every country on the planet means that there's a huge aftermarket scene allowing for almost unlimited customization. And the tweaks to this 2024 model, nicer TFT screen, more responsive engine, traction control, three kilos weight saving, improved front forks, partially backlit switch gear, mean that I'm honestly struggling to find meaningful negatives for this review. But you know me, I've found a few. The first thing I notice, having jumped off my Transalp, is just how much more compact the NX is, and I mean this in a good way. Concrete example, I can swing my right leg straight over the tail of the NX, whereas I always have to stand on the foot peg to get enough height to comfortably clear the rear of the Transalp, and most other adventure bikes. The NX feels noticeably lighter, less top-heavy. Seat height is a reasonable for a tall rounder 830mm, so 20mm less than the Transalp, but the narrow seat makes the actual standover height seem even lower. The seat itself is comfortable, supportive, and the material used to cover it is very grippy. On the downside, the prominent passenger hump is positioned quite far forward, meaning I can't quite shuffle backwards as much as I would have liked, but it's not bad. Once I'm on, my legs are a little cramped on the pegs, but at 6 foot 2 or 187 centimetres, nearly all bikes feel on the small side. The compact dimensions, low weight and beginner-friendly clutch make riding in traffic about as good as it gets on any motorcycle this side of a twist-and-go scooter. This is a great thing about having only 48 horsepower and 43 newton meters. The bike isn't constantly straining at the leash, egging you to open up the throttle, risking your license, serious injury, and generally annoying other road users. The brakes are gentle but effective, perfectly capable of stopping the bike, but if you accidentally squeeze the span adjustable lever too hard, it's not going to throw you over the handlebars. The ABS, as with most Japanese bikes, is on the intrusive side and dulls the overall feel of the brakes. The rear brake in particular lacks in bite, which I think is a shame because riders need to be encouraged to use the rear as much as possible. Since the 2022 update, Honda has given the CB Stroke NX twin discs up front, which I honestly think should be compulsory on all bikes, as they do sharpen up the feeling nicely and offer more substantial stopping power for not much extra cost. But in any event, the braking on the NX, at least at the front, is very satisfactory. How about comfort? Well, the revised shower single function big piston fork still dive a lot under braking, but it's no worse than other similar bikes. And of course, the payoff is a sumptuously wafty ride the rest of the time. The NX is a very comfortable motorcycle, much more so than, for example, the Triumph Scrambler 400X that I tested a couple of weeks ago. The new screen looks a bit short to me. It does make the bike look more butch, more off-roady, dare I say more Tenere 700. The idea being that when you're barreling along a dirt track standing up on the pegs, you don't want to be whacking your forehead on the edge of a tall screen every time you hit a pothole. Thing is though, I suspect most NX owners won't be doing much hardcore off-roading and a taller screen is nice to have on faster roads. I added the tall screen option on my Transalp and it's great, but I couldn't find one for the NX in the online configurator, although strangely Honda will sell you this not entirely necessary tinted short screen for €38. Euros. Give it six months though and aftermarket suppliers like uh, WRS, GV and MRA will no doubt come to the rescue. While on the subject of must-have options, I'd recommend the centre stand for about €160, Euros, although maybe watch out for quality as the one I ordered for my Transalp last year arrived covered in rust spots, so I naturally refused to pay for it and, in, and ended up going with a much nicer stand from Hepco & Becker. Similarly, maybe spend an extra €30 or €40 Euros over Honda's plastic handguards and invest in some metal-reinforced ones like those from Barkbusters. 
and I put on my Transalp. The advantage of these is that if you do drop the bike, they won't snap and they should support the weight of your bike, thereby, thereby avoiding the need for heavy upper crash bars that often amplify any vibration issues that are already present. Also, annoyingly, you'll have to pony up 30 euros for a 12 volt socket in the dash, as all you get from the factory is this ugly blanking cover. There's still no quick shifter available, unfortunately. I know they're not really necessary, particularly on a bike of this category, but they're good fun, and the one on my Transalp is exceptionally smooth, so it's a shame we can't have, have one on the new NX2. How about the engine? Well, in the press release, Honda says that, and I quote, Power and torque remain the same for the 471cc engine at 35 kilowatts and 43 newton meters, while an ECU update improves acceleration feel and Honda selectable torque control is now standard. Well, I'll take their word on that. It's nice to have traction control, especially if you can switch it off when venturing off-road, but in all honesty, I couldn't feel that much difference in the acceleration feel. Maybe a little more low down grunt, but it's hardly night and day over last year's model. Given that the engine is now Euro 6, I suppose we should consider ourselves lucky that the feeling hasn't been dulled. Suffice it to say that power is adequate, it's not mind-blowing by any stretch of the imagination. It's not supposed to be, but outright performance isn't what you ask for from a bike like this. I took it up to about 130 kilometers or 80 miles an hour here, and it didn't complain. It was beginning to run out of breath though at this stage, but overall it's more than adequate. Not to 100 kilometers an hour or 60 miles an hour is around five and a half seconds, which is a lot faster than most cars on the road. Subjectively, it feels ever so slightly less eager than, for example, the single-cylinder Triumph Scrambler 400X uh, that I tested a couple of weeks ago. But once it gets going, the NX offers enough power without scaring the rider if they misjudge the throttle. The new TFT screen is a huge improvement over the very difficult to read LCD clock of the previous generations. You now, now get a bright 5-inch colour screen that looks a bit like a simplified version of my Transalps. It also looks smaller for some reason, although they're actually both the same size. Must be something to do with the size of the plastic surround. Anyway, the important thing is that it's very legible, even in direct sunlight, as you can see here, and provides most of the information you need. But just with the Transalp, there's no fuel range, the one piece of information that I do want. Honda does this on purpose, so that as frustrated owners, we all upgrade to the Africa Twin. But I think that's misguided on their part. I don't think many owners... Um, are going to go from a 7,000 euro NX to a 20,000 euro Africa Twin just to have fuel range. I have range on my ADV350, so why can't I have it on the NX? Anyway, fuel consumption during the time I had the NX was 3.3 litres per 100 kilometres, which is typical Honda Excellent, especially as this was a brand new bike with only about 30 kilometres on the clock when I got it, so the engine was still very tight. Other practical aspects, well, there's just about enough space under the seat for a disc lock and the document wallet, but I think most owners will add some kind of tank or tail bag, possibly full-blown panniers and or top box. If you favour tank bags as I do, then the fuel filler will take a tank ring, like those from SW Motec or Givi, or you could go with a magnetic tank bag, as the NX's tank is metal. Off-road. Now, as regular viewers know, I'm absolutely not an off-road guru, but I do enjoy the occasional venture away from the asphalt when I come across an interesting looking track like this one in Benagil. The NX is relatively light. It's got a 19 inch front wheel, so suitable for light off-road duties like this. It's not top heavy, not too powerful. The brakes aren't grabby and the tires do an okay job. So all good, not quite. The biggest problem I found was that it was very difficult to stand up on the pegs. They felt very high, hence the slightly cramped riding position I mentioned earlier, and the bars are very low, so it felt as though I was almost on all fours with my backside up high and my chest too far down over the tank. An odd position and not very reassuring. So yes, you can take the factory NX off-road, but at least for me, it would be limited to the sort of track, a bit like the one you've just seen, where I could remain in the seat. I'm sure if you rally raid it up, you could consider venturing much further afield, but that's not really my thing, so I'll leave more qualified reviews to comment on that. So what are the negatives I promised you? Well, the one meaningful downside I have with the NX500 and the CB500Xs that came before is vibration. 
I had high hopes. I was hoping Honda would have been able to address the issue once and for all with this NX, which by my reckoning is the fourth generation of the bike, is it? But no. It's okay through the seat and foot pegs, but there's still a fair bit of buzziness through the bars, at least at higher speeds. It's not terrible, but it is more pronounced than the Transalp, and bear in mind that this demo bike had no options or accessories on it at all, so you'll need to be extra careful fitting things like crash bars and bash plates, which often increase vibration if they're not bolted on in a very specific way to precise torque settings. Other than that, there's the off-road sanding position, which doesn't suit my particular body shape, and those annoying but I suspect deliberate emissions, like no fuel range or ambient temperature reading on the dash, and having to pay an extra 30 euros for a 12 volt charging socket. But really, that's all I've got. What about competition? How does it compare to, say, the Triumph Scrambler 400X or the new Himalayan? Well, both of these are brand new to the market, whereas the NX is really just a facelift and therefore have the edge in terms of curbside appeal. Both are down on power though. The Triumph looks great, 10 kilos lighter, and it's over a thousand euros cheaper, but I don't think it offers the NX's versatility and is largely unproven in terms of reliability. I haven't ridden the Royal Enfield yet, but again, it's over a thousand euros less, weighs the same as the NX, and should offer the same sort of basic, rugged simplicity. Hopefully later this month I'll get a chance to ride one, so I'll let you know how it compares. So yes, there are a couple of relatively minor negatives, but overall for me, the takeaway with this bike is its ease of ownership. It's commonplace to delude yourself into thinking that you want 150 horsepower, shaft drive, semi-active suspension and heated seats, but in most real-world situations the NX500 is perfectly adequate and not having to constantly deal with 250 kilos and 25,000 euros worth of technology between your legs is genuinely liberating. A few weeks ago, I brought the 2024 Tiger 900 GT Pro to the same spot in Benagil, and I remember thinking, concentrate RM, what if I drop it? What if I, if my left hand slips off the clutch lever now and the bike goes flying off the cliff? What am I gonna to say to try and foul Garf? I didn't have any of these apprehensions with the NX because it's much more manageable physically and it's not so ruinously expensive and valuable that the slightest damage will cost an arm and a leg to repair. 18 months ago I actually ordered uh, an NX500, well it was the CB500X at the time, but I ended up changing my order to the Transalp when that was announced. With hindsight I still think it was the right choice for me as the Transalp is that little bit bigger physically and therefore offers my 6 foot 2 frame a bit more room and its extra power means that it's more at ease on the motorway and I do like the larger 21 inch front wheel but the NX is lighter and more manageable it's 3000 euros cheaper and has tubeless tires it's the sort of bike that makes you question your yearning for anything more it's comfortable, reliable, affordable, genuinely fun to ride and since the tweaks to the ECU for 2024 offers a bit more bottom end shove. And it now gets a better TFT screen with Bluetooth connectivity and simple turn by turn navigation. In a market of automatic ride height adjustment and active cruise control, the NX500 is a breath of fresh air. Anyway, that's all for today. Thank you to Honda Portimao for the loan of their demonstrator. Let me know in the comments if you'd rather cross continents on a bike like this, or whether you'd go for something from the other end of the spectrum, like the 1300GS or Multistrada V4. As always, thanks for watching.